A significant legal case on water use in the Rio Grande was heard in the U.S. Supreme Court this week. Correspondent Laura Pascas was there. She covered oral arguments from attorneys representing New Mexico, Colorado, Texas, and the U.S. I sat down with her earlier this week to talk about the background of the case and what she saw in the courtroom. Laura Pascas, thanks for stopping by. Thanks for having me, Sarah. A lawsuit that ends up in the Supreme Court doesn't happen overnight. How did we get here? So it's a pretty long story. I'll try to break it down. But basically, um, the irrigation districts in southern New Mexico and Texas, um, they were doing pretty well through the 80s and 90s. We had pretty wet decades. When the drought hit New Mexico in the 2000s, it became a lot harder um, for them to be getting their full allocations of water. So in 2008, the two irrigation districts, one in New Mexico and one in Texas, signed a new operating agreement with the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation, which operates the Rio Grande Project, which delivers water out of Elephant Butte Reservoir. So the three parties signed this operating agreement and New Mexico was unhappy because New Mexico wasn't a party to that. So New Mexico sued the federal government and a couple of years later Texas fired back with its own lawsuit since it's an interstate lawsuit it goes straight to the Supreme Court and basically Texas is alleging that by allowing farmers in southern New Mexico to be pumping groundwater they're drawing water from the river that should be flowing to Texas and therefore New Mexico isn't doing what it should be in terms of water deliveries to Texas. All right, and I think a lot of us remember those pictures of Elephant Butte Reservoir, really the levels being incredibly low in recent years. Is it connected to that? In a way, it is, because um, how people have explained it to me is Elephant Butte Reservoir is kind of the checking account. You can draw from that. Um, when those supplies start becoming uh, more difficult to rely upon, you look to your savings account and start pumping groundwater. And, and really, beginning in the 1950s, New Mexico started pumping a lot of groundwater. And so um, that has an impact not just on the aquifer and the groundwater levels, but it has impacts on the flows of the Rio Grande as well. What's at stake for New Mexico in this lawsuit that went to the Supreme Court? So none of the parties have really outlined what exactly they want and what the damages would be. But what I've heard from a few different people is, is two things, basically. If New Mexico were to lose this case against Texas in the Supreme Court, we could end up owing at least a billion dollars in damages, maybe more. Um, and more likely than not, um, groundwater pumping would be curtailed in the lower Rio Grande which would mean um, impacts on farmers, orchards, potentially the city of Las Cruces. It would be a big blow to southern New Mexico's economy. What did you observe in oral arguments? So it was really, um, really interesting to sort of watch that take place in the Supreme Court. And there were four parties arguing on Monday. It was the United States government, the states of Texas, Colorado, and New Mexico. And so each had time to present their arguments to the justices and the justices had a chance to ask questions and within an hour it's all wrapped up. And what did the justices say? How did they react? They had a lot of questions. It was really interesting to listen to the questions that different justices had. It was clear that they were familiar with the case and with the material and you know sort of do their research. Um, but they had a lot of questions trying to navigate Western water rights, which are really complicated even for people who pay attention to them all the time. Um, they were trying to understand sort of the differences between the Reclamation Act and the Rio Grande Compact. Um, so just a lot of questions about the laws and trying to figure out exactly what position New Mexico and Colorado are taking. Um, and understanding sort of where things go from here. Is it significant to you that um, very few of the justices are from the West? Yeah, I mean, I think I, th I think about that a lot as a New Mexican, whatever case is going up before the Supreme Court, but to be watching a Western water case before eight Eastern judges, um, Justice Gorsuch is the only Western um, justice on the bench. And it, it was interesting to see these people who are extremely intelligent and informed, kind of grappling with what we see as kind of the basics of Western water rights. And what did you note about New Mexico's legal representation in the court? 
So that was, that was striking. Um, like I mentioned, the, there were attorneys, there were four attorneys presenting their oral arguments. The United States, Texas, Colorado, and New Mexico, and New Mexico was the only party to have a private attorney up there. Um, I'm sure, well, I, I'm not sure, but I would guess that the other organizations also had contract attorneys to be working on the project, maybe, or the, the arguments or background research, but it was striking to see a private attorney up there rather than as one of our state attorneys. And what's the significance of that for you? I, um, it's, it's interesting, the, the, the attorney who was arguing for New Mexico is not a water attorney. He does not have Supreme Court experience. He does work for the law firm of, the former law firm of our current attorney general, Hector Balderas. Um, and I think there are some questions about why New Mexico was having um, Marcus Rial, who I'm sure is a very fine lawyer in, in his particular practice and area of expertise, but it was surprising for me um, to not see a water attorney up there. What are some of the reactions you heard from groups that are closely following this case that have interests in New Mexico? A lot of people are worried. It, New Mexico stands to lose a lot. Um, I think one of the, the more recent issues that's come up as the United States has been wanting to become more involved in this case is that what was being argued about on Monday was whether or not the United States can intervene in this lawsuit under the Rio Grande Compact. Um, and a lot of people, even outside of the lower Rio Grande, are worried that if they are allowed to intervene and if Texas prevails, that that would affect how New Mexico's groundwater rights are administered. And so I think that's a concern for people in southern New Mexico, and that concern is creeping north as well. New Mexico has been here before. The state was sued by Texas over water in the Pecos River. What should we consider and think about in that case in this more recent lawsuit? I think one of the, one of the things that people have said to me is there are ways people believe that these differences can be worked out. Um, across the table from one another through negotiations and talks and compromises rather than having than going to court and litigating and New Mexico has already spent 15 million dollars on this lawsuit um, litigation is expensive and with litigation you don't know what's going to happen you have no control over the outcome so I think there are certain people especially with the farmers in southern New Mexico like with Elephant Butte Irrigation District would much rather see some talks and negotiations than litigation. And as you continue to follow this case, as we continue to follow this case here in New Mexico and Focus, what should we be watching for next? I think just the fact that there are so many people interested in this water case, I think personally is great. It's something that I've been paying attention to since 2013. And I think every New Mexican, regardless of whether you have water rights in southern New Mexico, should be paying attention to what's at stake, how New Mexico handles this, and how we think about our water resources in the state and how we think about protecting them, particularly as the climate continues warming. Laura Pascas, thank you for coming in. You wrote a longer story with more details about the background and a timeline for the Santa Fe Reporter that we've also shared on our website, newmexicoinfocus.org. Thanks, Sarah.